How sincere are you with your thanksgiving? Have you noticed how we teach children about thanks? We, we tell a little child, okay, say thank you, right? Do they even know what it means? When we first start telling them, we say, say thank you. And, oh, okay, thank you. And, and are they really appreciative of whatever's been given to them? Probably not at all. And the problem is, some of us are just like little kids. We have to be reminded, say thank you. So is that why we need an annual celebration to thank God? Because we've maybe forgotten it as a nation that we have reason to give God thanks every single day? Do we need just one day a year to give God thanks? I would hope that Thanksgiving takes place every day. But how sincere are you with your Thanksgiving? Here's one of the ways you can test your, your Thanksgiving this year. See what you do on Thursday. Just monitor yourself, okay? <laughs> what, what do you do on Thursday? You're gonna, are some of you going to eat? Anyone going to eat? Raise your hand. Anyone chosen this week to fast? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, that's a surprise. <laughs> so you're going to probably eat. Some of you will gather with some family members. Some of them you like, some of them you don't. Some of you will be glad to be there. Some of you are wishing you were somewhere else. Some of you will watch football. Some of you won't. Some of you will be glad that you're not. <laughs> then how thankful will you be? Monitor what you do on Thursday. Because if you examine what you do on your Thursday, you'll see, am I really thankful? When you sit down at the meal, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> Start eating? <laughs> We had, we had a video that we showed last year. We still might show it again. It, it's a video of a, of a family that's, uh, that's sitting there, and everyone's just you know, eating and chowing down, and, and Grandpa's sitting there. And he's just watching everyone. And finally, he bows his head and takes his hand like this. And he starts to thank God silently as everyone else is eating. And finally, everyone starts noticing, Grandpa, Grandpa. And everyone gets quiet. Look at what you do on Thursday to see how thankful you are. Or better still, look at what you do on Friday to see how thankful you are. We're looking at Psalm 138 today. It's an interesting psalm. Uh, um, it's a psalm that begins a series of song, songs in the last portion of the book of Psalms, uh, a series of psalms by David in where he's celebrating God and he's just thankful for God. Uh, and then we'll get to the ha Hallel songs, which are the, the songs of Hallelujah, the last five songs, all, all about praising God. But, but the songs right before that, 138 to 144, there, there are these songs of pray, uh, thanksgiving, excuse me, where David is thanking God for things that God has done for him. In verse 1, it says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. In fact, let's read the whole text just so we kind of get a, the big picture feel for it. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. David is intentional, purposeful in his thanks and praise of God. 
Somebody said, God, you really outdid yourself this time. What you have done in fulfilling your promise by your word is far beyond what I had come to know about your loyal love and faithfulness. A gentleman named Merlin Carruthers actually came and spoke at a camp, that family camp that we had up here at Thousand Pines um, several years ago. Several years ago, camp and tried to fly his plane that morning up to uh, Ontario, and then was, we were going to pick him up there, and he was going to come speak at our, at our family camp. We had about 500 people up at family camp at Thousand Pines. And, and Merlin has written several books on praise. Uh, one of those books that he's written is called The Power in Praise. The unfortunate thing that morning when, when he was supposed to arrive, he was supposed to be here for Saturday and Sunday, and guess what happened on Saturday morning? It was foggy in Ontario, and he couldn't land the plane. So we had 500 people up here, children, youth, adults, waiting for Merlin Carruthers to come speak. I was supposed to pick him up at the airport. I'm waiting there for him to come to the airport. No cell phones, by the way, at that time, okay? So there wasn't even really good communication. And finally we found out he's not coming because he had to fly back. Had to fly back to Temecula and then drive from Temecula. So we had to do the first session, a session about praising God in all circumstances, right? <laughs> we had to do that without our speaker. Well, Merlin wrote in the book, Power and Praise, praising God is not a patent medicine, a cure-all, or a magic formula for success. It is a way of life that is solidly backed up in God's word. We praise God, not for the expected results, but for the situation just as it is. Did you hear that? Don't we usually uh, thank God and praise him for something good that happened? Carruthers says, no, we praise God just as the situation is regardless of what's happening. As long as we praise God with an eye secretly looking for the expected results, we're only kidding ourselves, and we can be certain that nothing will happen, nothing will happen to change us or our situation. Praise is based on a total and joyful acceptance of the present as a part of God's loving perfect will for us. Praise is not based on what we think or hope will happen in the future. So the people, well, I forget the count now, I had seen it once, 6,400 homes burned up north. 6,400 homes. The city of paradise basically totally burned down. We're, they're still going to be finding more people dead. How do you praise God when you've just lost everything, maybe even somebody you love? How do you praise God in the midst of those kinds of circumstances? Well, it's not, thank you, God, for burning my house down now. Thank you, God, that our whole city is going. Thank you, God, for all these terrible things that happened. Thank you, God, for all the people that died. No, it's not that, is it? It's, God, I praise you that in the midst of this, you are here with me. God, I praise you that whatever we're going to face in the future, however many more people we find, that you're going to help us walk through these days. God, I praise you that we're not alone. It's interesting. The text begins with this, with this crazy phrase when he says, I will praise you before the gods. I will sing your praise. What's he going to do? Go to where all the idols are and praise God? Well, that's very possible. Think about that. I will sing your praise before the gods. Isn't that what Elijah did when he was dealing with the prophets of Baal? 400 plus 450. There was 900, excuse me, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah who had gathered on a mountain along with the king of Israel. And they're up there on top of that mountain. And he says, okay, let's each build an altar. And you build your altar and you kill your bull and I'll build my altar and I'll kill my bull. And then, in fact, since there's so many of you, you guys go first. Pray to Baal to burn up your, your offering. And they go all day long and near the end of the day and he's been, he's been razzing them. Where's your God? You need to talk louder. Maybe he's asleep. Perhaps he's going on a vacation. Uh, maybe he's just busy. Uh, maybe he can't hear you. And he's just teasing them on and on. Finally he says, okay, forget it. Let me pray. But before he prays, he will multiple times take barrels of water and pour them over his altar. 
He'll dig a trench. Uh, before that, he had dug a trench around the altar so that the water not only covers everything on the altar, all the wood, but it also is going to fill up the trench. And then he prays. And he says, okay, God, because I believe you're God and you have the power. Now you show these people that you are the God of heaven and earth and you burn up that offering and fire comes down from heaven and consumes it and the whole altar. And I'm thinking Elijah's praising God in front of the idols <laughs> and all the worshipers because here's evidence proof of God's power. Thank you, God. From my heart, he says, and notice this, when you are in the presence of evil, 850 prophets of Baal, Jezebel, who wants you dead, and she's going to even work harder for it because you're going to kill all of her prophets. When you're in the presence of evil, what should you do? Praise the Lord. In fact, you may have to follow what he almost did when he started worship today, and that is sing your praise. <laughs> sing it out, the praise of God who is with you. Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. How do we praise God? It's got to be from the heart. Psalm 9.1 says, to the tune of the death of the son. Incidentally, Psalm 9, you want to talk about praising God in tough circumstances. David committed adultery. He had the husband of the wife Bathsheba, whom he committed adultery with, he had him killed. This, he is getting ready for the birth of a son. That son has been born. The son is, has, is ill and appears to be dying. The baby finally dies, and Psalm 9 comes from David's lips. Uh, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. This is a man who has understood how to praise God even in the worst of times because he knows God is there with him. Besides, he also later will tell his friends who come to him and say, why are you up now? You were fasting. You were on the ground. And, and, and we thought you were going to be like, committing suicide or something. You were so distraught. But as soon as the baby dies, you get up and you're like, you know, okay, let's go on. What happened to you? Uh, he says, because I know. And my prayer was that maybe God would heal the baby here. But he didn't do that. And what I know is, I will see the baby again. I will be reunited. And that's why I can get up and eat and praise God, because I know heaven's still coming, and I'm going to hold my son again someday. <clears throat> Verse 2 says, I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name for your unfailing love. He says, God, I, I've just got to praise you because you love me. <laughs> I had a conversation with Debbie this week, and I was feeling just one of those moments where, you know, wow, I don't think I thank her enough. I don't know, is once a year enough? No. No? No. no. So maybe twice. You know, like, so, yeah, let's double it, right? Okay, we'll go for two. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just wanted, it was, just wanted to say to her again, and, and I wanted to stop her and look, look in her in the eye, and I said, Debbie, I just want you to know, I love you so much. And I got to say, I would miss you horribly if you weren't here. Of course, her answer was like, yeah, right, Bill, yeah. <laughs> but, but there's those times, you just have, your, your heart is just so full of love, you've got to communicate that back, and that's what, that's what David's saying to God. He's saying, God, you've loved me so much, I've got to respond with praise. I've got to tell you how much I love you. It's, it's what he felt in Psalm, and Psalm 51 describes it, verse 1. David has been convicted now of his sin with Bathsheba. Nathan's come to him and said, you're the man. You're the guy who's really done bad. And David confesses that sin, and look in Psalm 51, verse 1, it says, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery at Bathsheba, David prayed, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. 
See, what David understands is that when he sins, and maybe even especially when he sins, and when he's convicted of it and it's pointed out to him, that it's in that moment that he really needs the love of God. The unfailing, unmerited favor, the loving kindness of God, the, the, the grace and mercy of God himself. And that's really what this word means here. Mercy, loving kindness. Psalm 86 uh, verse 5 says, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Verse 15, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God. Th if for no other reason, this is reason to give thanks. Listen to the next phrase. Slow to anger. <laughs> Thank you, God, because we deserve him being angry at us. Well, maybe you don't. I do. Okay? When we sin, we deserve it. Especially once we know Jesus. Yeah, Christians sin, don't we? Even after we know God, we still mess up, don't we? We need a God who is abounding in love, slow to get angry with us, who is forgiving and compassionate. Psalm 103, you've all heard this one many times. He's the one who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And verse 17, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with the children's children. God loves loving his people. Thank you, God, for your unfailing love. The psalm goes on, verse, again in verse 2, I will bow down toward your holy temple, will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. God faithful? Faithful to forgive? Faithful to come when we ask him? Faithful to meet our needs? Spurgeon said, if God has spoken alive, then where are we, brethren? We're in big trouble. Hear this word for faithfulness? It's a word for truth and truthfulness. God's not just faithful, he speaks the truth. In fact, what did Jesus say? I am the way, I am what? I am the truth, and I am the life. Psalm 40 says, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. We have a God who is faithful to us even when we are not. David goes on. And he thanks God for answers to prayer. Have you thanked him recently for, for prayers that have been answered? You know what, David, Debbie prayed last Sunday, right before worship. We were here in, a, in our group, and she prayed for more children to come. Last Sunday morning, she prayed for more children to come to worship. Guess what happened last Sunday? More children came. Oh, just a coincidence, right? It just happened that she happened to pray the prayer the same day that several families came back. And it was, that, that's all it was, right? In fact, we, we prayed it again this week. Some more children. We, uh, oh, we had a couple more children today, didn't we? Oh, well, it's just a coincidence again. Right? Isn't, isn't that what we call answered prayer? Just coincidences? Minor miracles for which God chooses to remain anonymous? A coincidence. Interesting. Thank, David says, when I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. Interesting phrase there. Isaiah 65, 24 says, Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. God's listening. How in the world does he do it? Let's all talk to him right now. Every single one of us can talk to him at the same time. And in the multiple languages all around this globe, all at the same time. Okay, that's, there's no computer can handle that. Okay. But God can. Before we even talked, God was already starting to hear. He's listening to our hearts as well as to our voices. God is a God who answers our prayers. Oh, by the way, he doesn't always answer them the way we're expecting, right? <laughs> 
one of those three answers that we use generically. He sometimes answers yes, he sometimes answers no, and he sometimes answers wait a while. We only want the yes. <laughs> but God is always answering because he's always listening to our prayers. And, and David is saying, God, I just got to thank you. I got to praise you because you respond to my prayers. But then notice this one other little phrase here. It says, and you greatly emboldened me. When I pray and you respond, God, it makes me co more courageous. It gives me actually not just courage, but strength to go with it. That's what it means to be emboldened. The, the New English Bible says, Thou didst answer me and make me bold and valiant hearted. I can go into a battle because God answers prayer. I don't need to be afraid. I've got courage and I've got strength. And I can go win because God has given me the power. God has encouraged me. And when he, I pray, God listens and so do I. God emboldens us, David says. And then he goes on, verse 4. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. And, and what David says is, I've got to thank you, God, for your decrees. Say it another way. I've got to thank you, God, for your living word. I've got to thank you for ways you, that you speak. I've got to thank you, Lord, for what you say to us. <laughs> Incidentally, how does God speak to us? Well, he speaks with outright words, right? But listen to what Psalm 19 says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. Use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. I mean, there's all kinds of preaching stuff here, folks. If you're, if you're listening, okay, yeah, and if you want to get distracted from what I'm saying, just let this text take you on a trip because God is saying things. The heavens are declaring constantly the glory of the Lord, the beauty all around us. I mean, can you really go outside there and look at the sky and see the beauty of this mountain and say, whoopee? <laughs> Thank you for evolution. I mean, come on, really, can you? Can, can you look at what we get to enjoy and not see and hear God speaking the glory and splendor of what he's done for us? But he goes on, the law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. What God has said to us will bless us if we'll listen and obey it. The precepts of, precepts of the Lord are right. They give joy to the heart. Have you ever felt bad for doing something wrong? That's because you break his decrees. It's because you go against what he said. And of course you're going to feel bad, but when you follow it, it gives you joy. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And get this, the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than the honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And then someday, every knee, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And take note, what is the psalmist thanking God for? His word. And what do we have in Jesus Christ? The living word of God that became flesh, dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, came to give us life and forgiveness, and one day every knee will bow. 
but not every knee will have accepted him as Savior. And so the psalmist goes on, David says, I've got to thank God for his glory. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. And in this passage, he actually says that the kings are actually going to praise him. And someday that will happen when every tongue confesses God. Isaiah 49 says it this way, verse 23, kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed because even the kings of the world will all acknowledge that God is God. We're in such a crazy time right now. Text message went out this week that, that, that Vice President Pence was meeting with the Prime Minister of Australia. And, and his text was just this. I am thankful that I get to meet with the Prime Minister of Australia, and he said his name, who is a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he's added to the text, we should pray for him. And I was saddened by the very next text that said, oh yeah, but you won't pray for anybody else. I'm like, oh my goodness. And in this tough time that we're in, there are Christ followers who are leaders around this world. And folks, we should be praying for them. But, but remember this, we don't just pray for the Christ followers. We're called to pray for all of our leaders. And someday, every leader on earth will declare and acknowledge that God is God, that he is the King of kings, that he is the Lord of lords. And so David says, I'm thanking God for his glory. And the whole earth is going to know it. He continues, and thank you for your concern for the lowly. Verse 6, though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Uh, by the way, there's an uh-oh in that, isn't there? <laughs> he, he, he's mindful of the lowly. What's the Bible say? Who is God? Who is man that you are mindful of him? God cares about every single human being. Everyone. There's not a single human alive that he doesn't care about. And you, you put in anything, anyone in that blank. Does he care for, does he care for the person seated next to, to me? Yes. Does he care for me? Yes. Does he care for the person down the street that, that uh, just ran over my dog? Yes. Does he care for the person that's in jail? Yes. You put any, any name, any person, any individual, any group in there, does God care about them? Yes. He loves them. And he especially cares about those who are lowly. James says it this way. He gives us more grace. And that is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. That same thought is in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. God cares about the lowly, the brokenhearted. That's why Jesus comes to minister to them. He's constantly doing that even when the religious people who are a little bit high and mighty, just a little bit proud, prideful and egotistical, even when they are opposing him, he continues to give himself to those who are lowly. Though the Lord is exalted, though he would not have to acknowledge anybody, though he is as far from us as the heavens are above us, God still cares about the lowly. He looks kindly on the lowly, lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. For those who are arrogant and prideful, then he kind of just backs away. And folks, that is not a good place to be. Okay, you want to do it on your own? And God simply pulls back 
and he watches from afar. David continues his psalm of praise when he says, I've got to thank God for his protection. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. Somebody believes that, that one of the reasons why David wrote this psalm is because it's right after one of those times that he'd been chased by, who knows, King Saul, Absalom, his son, someone else. It was a time of trouble, and God had protected him and preserved him and given him life. And so now he is saying, I've got to praise God for that. That even though I'm walking in troubled times, even though I'm in a difficult place, even though things are really bad, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, God, because you are with me. It's Psalm 27, 5. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. When life has its greatest troubles, what David is acknowledging, and the reason he's praising God is because in the midst of his worst of times, he's acknowledging God is with me. And so I praise God. Notice, I'm not thanking God for the fire. I'm not thanking God for the home that got burned down. I'm not thanking God for the person that died, although I am thankful for them, but I'm not thankful that they died, but I am thankful that in the midst of all this, in the midst of the pain that I might be facing, in the midst of the fears I have about tomorrow, in the midst of the challenges I'm going through, in the midst of the heartache I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing, God is with me. By the way, has anybody here ever ridden their bi a bicycle up here in the mountains? Oh, oh, you all have missed a couple of you. That's it. You are miss okay. Come on, how many have you ridden up here in the mountains here in Crestline area? Oh, okay, a few more of you are admitting to it. Isn't it fun? It, well, what a privilege. You never get to go always downhill or flat up here. You always get the opportunity to ride uphill. It doesn't matter where you go, you're going to still get the opportunity to ride uphill. Every route that I work on, even if you ride around Lake Gregory, which is kind of the easy, wimpy route. Excuse me, no offense, man. Okay, but if you ride around Lake Gregory, even there you get to go up and down. You might want to pick which route you go because some of the up is, is a little bit worse, especially if you're going up San Ritz. Okay, anyways, it's, it's just always that way. Here's the frustrating thing I have. Every time I ride my bike from my house, there is no way to get back to my house without going up a steep hill. So if I, go, if I go Crest Forest to Lover's Lane and try to go up Lover's Lane, the nice thing about that one is, is it's super, super steep, but it's shorter than if I go Crest Forest all the way over to, um, to, to the first street, where, uh, what's it called, Rate Road. If I, if I go up, to, up Rate Road, Okay, that's steep too, not quite as steep at Lover's Lane, but it's longer. Doesn't matter. Wherever I ride on the mountain, I get to go uphill. Thank you. <laughs> I guess for me that's a parable. No matter what I'm doing in life, life has its troubles. And, and I'm probably not going to be able to avoid the troubles. But like David... If I, get, if I get it, I will understand that in the worst of troubles, in the steepest of hills, that God's there with me, that that will give me the strength to go up that hill because he's with me. And so David says, I thank God. I thank God for his protection. I thank God for his presence. I thank God for him being with me. And he'll wrap up the song with this. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. And here's the thing that David understands. He knows that no matter what's going on in his life, God is not going to abandon him. He knows a promise that comes from the New Testament. It's Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He knows that the ultimate end is victory in heaven, that no matter how bad it gets, so if I'm dealing with some illness like cancer, if I'm fighting off dementia, if I'm struggling to pay my bills, if I'm l literally dying right here, that God is with me and God's working me towards something very special, and it's victory with him in Christ Jesus. And so what does he say? I'm going to thank God. 
I'm simply going to acknowledge that He loves me. I'm going to bask in that love. I'm going to enjoy that love. I'm going to celebrate that love. And I'm going to thank Him for it so that even after I've struggled with my enemies, I'm going to acknowledge. In fact, look at this. Psalm 13. But I trust in your unfailing love. Psalm 13, David clearly has written after he's been fighting his enemies. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. How sincere are you with your thanksgiving? What did Jesus do for you? Died on a cross when you didn't want to know him. Gave his life so you could experience joy and life, forgiveness, grace, and mercy, loving kindness. How thankful are you? Does your thanks invade every day of your life? Are you able to praise God for what he's done? Or are you still at a place where you're not sure he really exists? And if you are, it's time to test him. If you're not confident that there is a God, if you're not sure that Jesus rose from the dead, then it's time to say, Jesus, prove yourself to me. Because what, if you look at it, what David's been saying in, psalm, in this psalm is, God, you've proved yourself to, to me. You've proved it through the prayers I've prayed. You've proved it through what I see in nature. You've proved it through, through your word. You've proved it through your grace and mercy. You've proved it through all kinds of things. You've proved it for what, you, what you're going to do in the future. God, you've proved yourself. And if you don't believe it, it's time to test him. And God, show yourself. Prove to me whether you exist or not. And the God I love, and the God I hope you love, will show himself to you because he's already done it. Father God, we praise you. There's so much we have to praise. This, this simple list here that Dave has given to us in this psalm is, is special, God, and there's so much more, and you deserve way more than we are capable of giving to you. And that, God, even moves us to more praise. You've been kind to us when we didn't deserve it. You've held back your anger when we did deserve that. You have died on a cross just because you loved us. And you rose to prove that you had victory over sin and death. And you invite us now to follow you and to live enjoying that love knowing we're not alone, knowing you're with us, knowing that you have a plan for us that you're working out and that, that ultimately you're not going to give up on us no matter how bad it might be, but you're working something special for us and ultimately it's victory in heaven. And God, I pray for each person here today and whatever battle they're going through, whatever struggle, whatever challenge, that they would feel your presence, Lord. Know they're not alone and know how much you love them. And Lord God, I pray that we would be able to praise you in front of the idols. Because there's idols that speak to us, that try to say you're not worthy of God's love. There's enemies that try to say we don't deserve it, and we don't. There's, there's those idols that want to try to convince us that there's no way God could love us because we keep messing up. And God is saying, I have loved you with an...